to turn your Bible to Romans 10, or you can read what I have on the slides up there. I have Romans 10 up there. It's always nice sometimes to follow along, though. Maybe make a note in your Bible or something. I, I look at Bibles as something that should be worn out. You can see i got notes all over. Pages get tattered. I write ideas there because I think if I write them on pieces of paper, I'll lose those pieces of paper. But if it's in the Word, whenever I hit that chapter again, I'm like, oh, yeah, man, forgot that I saw that before. I thought it was, forgot it was there, so I connected. I think uh, Bibles ought to be like tires. they got to keep being changed all the time. So that's important. Maybe you have one special Bible you don't want to touch to keep pristine, but it should definitely have a workable Bible as well. But uh, here in Romans 10, well, we're going to start off the end of Romans chapter 9 because it started to introduce the same subject in Romans 9. We're going to be talking about uh, salvation. We're going to be talking about where the Jews went wrong, where Israel went wrong, and it's some pretty powerful stuff. It really touched me and affected me this week. And I hope that it touches you and affects you the same way it did me. You know, it makes me want to strive harder, work harder for God, seek Him more, know Him more. You know, it makes me want to uh, share the gospel more. All those kind of things came to me after reading this, this chapter here and, and diving into it pretty deep there. But uh, it starts off in Romans 9, 30 to 33. It says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness... Did not succeed in reaching that law? Why? It's going to go all the way to the end of chapter 10 answering the same question. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. All right, so what happened here to the Israelites? It says the same thing then in chapter 2, pretty close, you know, different words, but same, same concept is they had God's law. They were God's chosen people. Israel was God's chosen nation to be a witness to the entire world of God and His people. And there's a special thing that Israel had. And, uh, and what did they do? They, 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 had the, they had the righteousness. What does righteousness mean? It means being right with God. Righteousness is God's right way. That's what righteousness is. We can't just make up righteousness. We can't be like, that's righteousness for you, but it's not righteousness for you. No, there's only one type of righteousness, and it's God's way is righteousness. All right? So the Israelites had the law that should lead to righteousness, but they didn't have any faith. They didn't have faith. They didn't believe it. They made it their own law. They made it their own law that they made it their own works. They thought, well, if I'm doing A, B, and C, then I'll be just fine on Judgment Day. If I'm doing this and that, then I, I'm a good person. I'm pretty good. In fact, the majority of people and churches you talk to, I saw a statistic, 80% of churches will preach and teach, and people in the church will even say, they say, if you die today, how you get to heaven? They'll say, because I'm a good person. None of us are good people, and nobody is going to heaven because of any good work. It says that explicitly over and over again in the Bible, and it's the same mistake that the Israelites made. All the way, think about it. This is our current common day thing. I'm a good person. They thought the same thing thousands of years ago. The same wrong thing. Every false religion that's ever been made has based on works. Hinduism, Buddhism, Muslim, it's all like, if you do good things, you're a good person, you're going to be okay. In fact, we're going to get into this chapter today, and it talks about faith a lot too. And you hear all the time, well, they were a person of faith. People of faith go to hell every single day. The only person of faith that's not going to go to hell is if your faith is in Christ, in that stone that's the rock. Any other faith is worthless. It's garbage. It doesn't do anything for you. You can't be a good person and be a person of faith and think you're going to be okay on Judgment Day. You should be terrified, shaking in your boots, seeking out, searching out Christ while you still have breath in yourself is where you should be right there. And we're going to hit that too. There's places in the scripture, in Revelation, where people are so terrified, the world's falling down on them, and they're screaming out to God, and God will not hear them. He kills them. He puts judgment on them. He does not save them. You know, I've always heard, yeah, as long as you have breath, you have hope. Well, you do, but God's not going to take it like some kind of a swindle. You can't swindle God. You can't be like, well, you know what? Now that I really need you, because I'm about to die from cancer, now that I really need you because... The, the fire is coming for me. The world's falling down on me. Now I want you to save me. God's no fool. You cannot fool God. You cannot use God. God is not someone you can manipulate. If you make up your own false religion, you manipulate it all you want. It's like you're writing your own fiction book. You're like, well, this is what my God will do here. This is what my God will do here. We don't have that possibility. 
God is the God of the Bible. If you don't believe something in the Bible, you don't believe God. This is God's Word, and it's what we have to accept. It's what we have to submit to. It's the only non-fiction religion that there is. Every other religion is just fiction. It's man-made up. And just like the Israelites, even though they had the right religion, they had the right Word, they had the law, they still didn't have faith in it. And they had faith in their own works. And when Jesus came, which was prophesied so much about Him, we see that, uh, and this, was, this is Old Testament, I think Isaiah right here says, Behold, I am laying in Zion, that's you know, like the Jewish nation, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This was a big deal to the Jews. The Jews hated Jesus. They still hate Jesus. In fact, most times when you go, you go there, I even re heard one guy talk about it a few years ago. There was even some crazy rabbi who was putting up posters saying, kill, kill the Christian missionaries, kill them. A Jewish rabbi was putting that up because he was so mad and so angry at, at that. I mean, we love Israel because we know God has something to do with Israel still in the future. But Israel today hates God. They hate Jesus. They may say they worship God, but if they're not a Messianic Jew who believe in Jesus, they're just as lost as anybody else, and it should be even more offensive to them because they truly have the Word of God. You know, their Old Testament stuff is the same as our Old Testament. They've got it, and it's not leading them to where it should be leading them because of their own pride. Their pride is saying, well, I'm such a righteous person. I do all these things. Righteousness is God's righteousness, not our own righteousness. And, uh, and Jesus was, and he was a rock of offense. It very much bothered the Jews. The Jews tried to kill him all the time, the Pharisees and everybody, when they went toward him right there. So, so that's, what, uh, that's what was going on in the end of uh, this thing, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, <clears throat> in Romans 10, I got a little quote right here. Okay, you know, I like to throw some quotes in here as well. I put, I hope that each of us has a heart on fire with zeal. Jesus warned those who were neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, he would vomit them out of his mouth. Revelation 3.16. He wanted his people to be filled with zeal, but a zeal according to knowledge. Zeal that is informed by his word. The fire in our hearts is not simply a heat, but also light, which comes from God's word. Okay, That's something the Jews had. The Jews had zeal. They were excited. They were following God. They did everything to follow after God. But it was really their own works is all they were trusting in. They were like, I'm doing all these things, so I'm good. And they prided themselves on that when they should have humbled themselves before the Lord. And they should have the zeal, but you've got to have zeal with the knowledge. If you don't have zeal with the knowledge, you know, it's not going to get you anywhere right there. You've got to have zeal and knowledge. Where do we get the knowledge? We get the knowledge in the Bible, in the Word. And I like this too, this, this quote here, because look, it says... You know, when something is real hot, it's also light. Think about that. You see a burning hot ember. There's also light coming from it. And we talk about all the time in the Bible that Christ is the light. He's the light of God that shines in our lives. And if we're truly hot for God and we're burning up, then that light ought to be shining off from our lives. People ought to be able to see, man, that person's a Christian. That person follows Jesus. That person is different than everybody else that's around here. That's what ought to be being seen. It's, and, uh, and it does say in Revelation 3.16 that you can't be lukewarm. Too many churches today, too many people today think, well, you know what? I'm okay. You know, I said some sinner's prayer sometime or something, but I'm just like everybody else. And that's okay. That's all fine. It's definitely not fine. It says in the Bible that he'll spit you out of his mouth. You're either in the kingdom or you're outside the kingdom. There is no standing on the fence. Okay, you get, we got, if we're on the fence, we've got to jump off into the fire on God's fire side right there and be hot for Christ. Okay, it says it's better if you're cold, because if you're cold at least, then you're going to get convicted. If you're lukewarm, you think, well, you know what, I'm good. That doesn't apply to me. All of this word applies to us. Every single word of it applies to us. It's not that we get saved and we're a Christian and now it doesn't apply to us. It applies to us. That's why we get saved, to follow after Christ. Everything applies to us. And we need, to, we need to let it seep into our lives to transform us, to change us, or we're going to be in bad shape. All right, now back to Romans 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire of prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He's talking about these Jewish guys that were stumbling over the rock of Christ. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So what we just talked about, they had the zeal, but not according to knowledge, Okay. And I bet they could spit out scripture left and right, but they didn't really know it. They didn't really know what it meant. They didn't really live by it. They just changed it to how they wanted to suit it for themselves and changed it so that way it would fit them. If they would have known it, 
Jesus even said when he argued with the Pharisees, he says, he says this, you know, I am in the Word, and if you search the Word, it will lead you to me. That's what he even told them. And they knew the Word. They should have known that it led to them. They should have known Isaiah 53. The forbidden chapter now is what the, the Jews call it right there, what people call it to talk to the Jews maybe, because they don't even mention it. They won't even go anywhere near Isaiah 53, most of the Jews today there. It's a sad, terrible thing. But it says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What did I say before? They, they were making their own religion. They had the truth, and they just made their own religion out of it. They made fiction out of nonfiction. They said, well, this is how we're going to do things, and that's how we're going to do it. Well, we need to submit to God's word. We don't have a choice. We can't be like, well, I think it says this. I feel this and that. No, we've got to say, what does this say? And we've got to go by this, and we've got to submit to it. It says here, it says they did not submit to God's righteousness. And there's only really one righteousness. It's God's right way. Nobody is righteous outside of God's right way. Okay, that's called self-righteousness, and it's a sin. It talks about quite a bit in the Bible. Self-righteousness is a bad thing, all right? We find our righteousness in Christ. The righteousness we have when we're a believer is imputed to us from Christ. Our righteousness is Christ. He righteousness us. Remember I said that a few weeks ago when we preached on some, that the real way that this would be said is that Christ righteousness us, like a verb. It's His righteousness. It's not our own. It's all His. And these guys were finding it in their own righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And this is conditional. People who believe, okay? This isn't everybody. This is those who believe, all right? Nobody who doesn't believe is going to be, uh, is going to be, it's going to be saved, all right? This doesn't affect all these good things, all this wonderful word, all the good things God did. It doesn't do anything for those who don't believe. We must believe. Like last week we talked Romans 9 about election, and people sometimes say, well, how do I know if I'm elect? Well, you can know one way is do you believe? If you believe, you are elect. If you believe, you are saved. But we're going to get into that kind of belief, okay? The Pharisees believed the Scriptures. The demons believed the Scriptures. The demons were the first ones who called Christ God. They knew who he was. It's the first time we read in the Gospels who calls him God. The demons call him God because they know exactly who it is. They know the Bible so much better than we know the Bible. They've been around a lot longer than we have. They were around when they saw Adam and Eve form. They were around when the world began because the angels were made before man. Is what you know most of us believe because we see the devil in the garden. He is already in a fallen state. So they, they were made before man was even made. They've seen it all. They are not confused. They don't believe in the evolution lie or anything like that. They have seen it all. They've watched mankind. They've watched the prophets go. They've watched the scripture. They know it all. But one thing they never do is you never see a demon calling him Lord. Lord in the sense of God supreme. As the one we will all answer to. Lord in the sense that the Bible puts it in. Not Lord in the sense of some, hey buddy, you're my friendship pal. Let's just go out and have a cheeseburger. And if you don't want to have it my, your way, then I'll have it my way. You know, it's not, it's not like that. He is the king. He is the ruler. He is above us. He is our master. And we must serve him as such. And you never see the demons call him Lord. They will acknowledge him in all the other ways. They know he's God. They know all these kind of things. They know he's powerful. You know, remember when the, he cast the demons out? And they were like, no, no, it's not that day. You know, we don't want that to happen to us. Because they knew, because the demons have been everywhere. They've been all over the place. The only place they really have been is hell. Not all the demons have been to hell. It talks about in the Bible that some demons are cast down into hell, never to return, or already right there. But not all have been to hell. You know, so a lot of them have been everywhere, but they have not been to hell yet. And they're terrified because they know one day it's coming. They know that judgment is coming. They know what the Word says. They know that God never, never lies or anything like that. They're the father of lies right there, and they know what's coming for them. But, but, they're, but they don't believe. Their belief is a different belief, all right? It's a belief that's not a saving belief. So here we see Romans 10, 5 through 8. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will ascend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. All right? This goes back to faith. It goes back to faith, to believing in God and to knowing His Word. And uh, 
It's not going like, like who's going who's gonna to go down and see if, if Jesus is still in the grave? You know, who's going to go up to heaven? Who's going to do this? You know, it says, don't say those kind of things. You need to trust God. You need to trust that Jesus was resurrected. So it's a stipulation that says if you believe in Christ, you believe in the resurrection. Anybody that doesn't believe in the resurrection of Christ, the full bodily resurrection of him, is not saved, and they're denying him. Over and over again, when Paul gives stipulations in the Bible about if you're a believer, it's you have the right Jesus, you confess him, and you believe in the resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, it says we have no hope whatsoever. In fact, in one place it says we are all men most miserable if we don't believe that Jesus was not raised from the dead. And this word of faith, this has been brought way out of context by some folks. I, I call it a cult even. People like Benny Hinn, people like Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and they try to say that what they do is they bring the word of faith into the realm where they say what you speak is like God's word taking effect. Nowhere in the Bible do you find something like this. And in fact, one thing that they do that makes me so angry is they basically, to sum up the whole thing of it, is they are bringing God down to a man level, and, and we're bringing man to a God level. And they preach a her heresy called little gods. And if you look at where the little gods came from, when Jesus said, you know, they call him God, and he goes, aren't you all little gods? That was sarcasm. If you look back to Psalm 86, when Jesus said that, he, the people are crushed with that psalm. It's saying, you all little gods, like you think you're this? You are nothing, is what it's saying. It's not saying, you're all little gods. No. And the Word of Faith movement will say that. It's a bad, bad sense. We, we should never put ourselves on a pedestal where we are at a godlike level. We are at a humble level, created. We are the created beings. He is the creator, and we must submit and follow him. You know, many times when you start going on that kind of level, the next thing you know, you start ignoring a lot of things in the word. You start to pick and choose what you want. You start to manipulate it, and it's really no different than the Pharisees were. No different at all. That's exactly what they did. They didn't apply it to themselves. They applied it to everybody else. They did not apply it to themselves. we got to always apply it to ourselves. It's like that a fallen condition of man, I say sometimes, a guy named Brian Chappelle wrote a book on preaching. And in every passage we read, we should read about the fallen condition of man. Every passage we read, it ought to be like a knife sticking in us a little bit. Like, oh, that's me. And there ought to be some change afterwards. We ought to be like, you know what? I know God doesn't like that. I need to serve him. I need to follow him. I need to repent. I need to humble myself and be like, God, help me that it's not me anymore like this. Help me that I'm able to come and follow after you. And then when we pray according to the will of God, it will happen. And I tell you what, the will of God is that we follow him, that we glorify him, and that we truly serve him, that we don't build ourselves up as a little God and serve ourselves, but that we're truly serving him. It's all about Jesus. There's a song one time. And say all about Jesus. And that, that's what it's all about. It all comes down to Jesus. Everything. Down to Jesus right there. And if you don't have that, that stone that was a stumbling stone to others to stand on, you have nothing. There is no other hope. There is no other religion. There is no other way. Man can't think that I can do this and that and God's going to be fine with this. No. We've got to be fine with His way. His way is the only way. His way is the best way. When we follow God, it's the best way because He loves us. He loves us like a love like nobody has ever seen before. He doesn't love us and then think, well, you can't do this because I don't like you or something. No, He loves every one of us. He loves us so much that He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to believe. He wants everyone to repent, it says in the Bible right there, to follow after Him. And it says here that... Uh, this is a cool verse. You know, I like to put these cool slides when I happen to be able to find them in my, in my Bible program. But it says, Romans 10, 9. Okay, this is big salvation verses right here. Very important verses right here. Verses we should know, we should memorize. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right? This is incredible. And this is so, so true, so honest. The Word of God. How are we saved? By confessing with our mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. Remember I said no demon has ever called Jesus Lord. No devil has ever looked at him as Lord. I talk about lordship salvation all the time. You know, he's either your Lord of all or he's not your Lord at all. All right, when you look at the biblical view of things right there, lordship salvation means that when you come into salvation, completely by the grace of God, of him drawing you and saving you, it's not our own power, it's nothing that we can boast of. That he is then our Lord. People who are saved 
follow Jesus as Lord. People who are not saved and maybe just said some sinner's prayer, you can tell right away if Jesus is their Lord or not by the actions of their life. If they're, if they're doing all the sinful stuff they did before, they could care less about God, they're not saved. They're lost, completely lost. They may have said something. It didn't affect anything, all right? If it's not in the heart, look at this, the heart. The heart is the deepest, most innermost being of a person. It's not just an intellectual thing, and it's not just a feeling thing. It's the innermost part of your body. It's like, it's like you, you really want something, you really know something, or maybe you're desperate, maybe your child's sick real bad, or something, your family's hurt real bad, and in your heart you're like, oh, I sure do hope they're better. I hope I can do this, I hope I can do that. That kind of heart feeling and passion is what we come to salvation with. When we believe Him, and we confess Him, and we believe it in our heart. Now what is Jesus? He is Lord. He's not our buddy. He's not some guy that you know I'll go to him when I need a fix. I go to him when I have a bad thing or some terrible atrocities happening in my life, and then I need him. He's not your Lord at all then. Then you think that, well, well, if I can do this, then this will work over here. You're still your own God. You're your own Lord. If you're submitting to God, then He is your Lord, and He's the Lord of all things. And it says, what do you have to believe? Believe that God raised him from the dead. Like I said, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't have faith. You know, somebody says, I don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I think, okay, this is the lost person. I need to start evangelizing this person. Because they don't even have Jesus. If they don't know that he was resurrected and, because, and, and paid the price for their sins and paid so he could be reconciled to God. And it says, then you will be saved. All right? Here's a uh, quote from Joel 2.32. All right, this is another great passage to memorize, especially if you have any Jehovah Witness friends. I have a Jehovah Witness friend. I don't know if she watches my stuff that I put online. But the, I sent her this passage this week when I read this and made this connection. All right, Joel 2.32 says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, notice that's all capitals, that means it could say Jehovah or Yahweh. In the New World Translation, Jehovah Witnesses, it says Jehovah for sure. All right, shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there should be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. All right? So not even all Jerusalem was ever getting saved. The whole nation of Israel wasn't all getting saved. It was always a remnant. And what was the one factor for the remnant? That they believed. That they believed with real faith that Jesus is their Lord and that they confess Him that He raised from the dead. That's how they were getting saved right there. That's, a, that's the way to salvation. So many times people are like, well, how do you get saved? And that's a big question. If we can't answer somebody, if they ask, how do I get saved? Then, man, we're really missing the foundations, all right? The way we get saved is we believe in Jesus. We submit to Him. He is our Lord. We confess Him. It says you must confess, all right? It's confess. That means it's not a secret. It's not in your private prayer closet, Jesus is your Lord. It's everywhere you are, Jesus is your Lord. You're confessing Him, all right? And, and we're believing Him. This is how we get saved right here. That's it. And you know how we get saved, truly. We're talking about Romans 9. Is God chooses us. He's chosen us from before the foundations of the world. But like I said, it's like a clock. Here, completely, it's all God. He's chosen who He's chosen. He knows everything. He knows every person before they're ever born when they're going to die, where they're going to go. He's outside of time. He controls everything. He is all sovereign. There's not one thing that God does not know. It's not one thing that will ever surprise God. But yet, at the same time, here's this wheel turning the other way. I don't know if I could do this two different ways. But the wheel turning the other way is what does it show on our part? What does it show on our part? On our part, it shows that we're confessing Christ, that we're believing in our heart, that we're, that we're, that we're believing He was raised from the dead. All right, That's what it shows on our part. And if this doesn't happen on our part, for sure this part isn't happening over here either. Okay, So people who are chosen, these things follow right here when they're saved. And this is a good point to make because there's a lot of churches out there and they get so excited because they have big altar calls, and emotional service, hundreds of people come to get saved and not one of them come back to church after that. Not one of them are following Jesus after that. Basically what that did just did is they just gave a false lie to all those people and said, you say this prayer, you'll be saved. They're not saved because they just say that prayer. They've got to believe in Jesus. They've got to call that mercy prayer like, God, I'm a sinner and I need you. If a person doesn't know they're a sinner, if a person doesn't know that they are on their way to hell, there's no way that they are going to go with a Savior. And that's something else I learned this week looking. The word Lord is not so often, Lord is all over the place talking about Jesus. Savior is only used like 32 times in the entire Bible, and that's it. 
Savior is always after Lord. If Jesus is not your Lord, your Master Supreme, the one that you follow, the one you submit to, your King, the one that you obey orders from, the one that you follow with everything you've got and you continually go to each day to seek, to trust, to rely on, to follow, then He is not your Savior. All right? There is no, like, Savior over here and I live like the devil and do whatever I want to do. That nowhere in the Bible does it show that. That's a false picture of modern-day man that just basically builds churches and brings money in, and people are all going to a place, it's a terrible place, that they're going to be shocked about the end right there. It's important that Jesus is our Lord. And the, what I pointed out about this scripture is this capital letters right here, Jesus is Lord, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, is the same verse as right here. All right, hold on, it's the next one right here. It, say, it says, all who call on the name of the Lord, that call the name of the Lord, was talking about Jesus, will be saved, all right? So the same Lord in the Old Testament, Jehovah God, which no person that would believe in Jesus would argue with that, probably no, no Jew either, it says in the New Testament too about Jesus. And that that's because he's the same Lord. He even said when he talked in, in John 8, he told the people, the Pharisees he was arguing with, he said, I am. He goes, before Abraham was, I am. That I am means I am Jehovah God. I am God Almighty. And it says then they picked up stones to kill him because they hated him for that. Because they knew it. In John chapter 5, he said, why do you try to kill me? And Because they did it multiple times. And he said, because you make yourself out to be equal with God, is what they told him. So it's a great verse. I sent it to the lady. I hope she responds to me right there. What, what's, what's their answer for this thing? But the same thing in the Old Testament is the same thing in the New Testament. And another great fact about this chapter we're reading, chapter 10, uh, all Paul's epistles, which is 13 of them, maybe 14 if you wrote the book of Hebrews, we have the most citations from the Old Testament in Romans 10. Romans 10 has more citing of the Old Testament than anything else. Why is that? We started off with the Israelites. We started off with how they have their law of righteousness and this and that, but they're, they're not getting there. And it, what it takes is it takes the Old Testament to explain the gospel. You know, too many people today are like, I'm just a New Testament person. You can't understand the New Testament as much as you should unless you know the Old Testament. The Old Testament shines light for the New Testament. The Old Testament brings out the gospel message. The Old Testament brings out the life that's in Christ. It brings out so much more that you understand so much better. And we can see Paul, an apostle, using tons of the Old Testament here in order to bring us into the gospel, the New Testament, and salvation. This, this is the salvation chapter right here and how we're saved. All right, this is a quote right here. I, I, Jesus' is Lord is coming up. I'm going to show you. It says, uh, we have come up with various techniques for doing so. The technique employed at a general crusade is the altar call. People are asked to respond to the gospel by coming to the front of the church or Coliseum or to raise their hand, pray a prayer, or sign a card. All these techniques are designed to urge people to take a step to finalize their commitment to Christ. Nothing is actually wrong with these things. Notice that. There's nothing wrong with that. I've been at these things, and sure enough, they're like, does anybody want to come down and pray with the new people on salvation? I'll jump right down and pray with them, you know? But I'll let them know, hey, this isn't just some kind of prayer that you just can't recant some words and some magic potion happens. This is a repentance, a change of life. This is you've just decided, you've just seen reality and light and reality. A lot of times these things are in the emotional times where they kind of get a glimpse like a man in the mirror. And they see the man in the mirror, they see where they're really at, that they're a sinner and that they need Christ. And I let them know, this isn't something you're just going to walk away from and forget afterwards. This is something that's the beginning of the rest of your life. This is a life change that just began. And I'm like, and if you still want to say that prayer, Jesus is going to be Lord of everywhere in your life, not just one little part of your life that you will want to be a Lord of right there. Then let's go for it. And if not, you better think about it a little bit more as well then, though. But there's nothing particularly wrong with it. It says, unless we think that walking down an aisle, raising our hands, signing a car, saying the sinner's prayer will get us into the kingdom of God. And too many people are like that. You know, they're like, just say this prayer with me. Say this prayer with me. You know, I've seen street preachers before. The street preachers that me and Joe associate with are not like this, all right? But I've seen street preachers before saying, let me just get you to say this prayer. Come on, say this prayer with me. And then, and then they say... And then they say, after they say their prayer, they go, and now you're saved, you're saved. And they walk away like, I got somebody saved today. And that person, all it was, was they just wanted to get you out of their hair. So they're like, sure, I'll pray with you. And there's no difference, there's no change. It's so much better to do it the right comfort style. Bring them to the Ten Commandments. Ask them, if you die today, how are you going to go to heaven? 
Well, because I'm a good person. Well, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had an adulterous thought? Have you ever hated somebody? The Bible says that's the same as murder. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Well, how do you think on Judgment Day you could stand before a holy God who doesn't make any mistakes, who doesn't let any injustice happen, and come into the kingdom of God? You're never going to be able to come to the kingdom of God. Unless you realize that you're broken, that you're a sinner, you can't come, and then you give him John 3.16. But whosoever believes that, that he's at shall not have shall not shall not have a bad, but have eternal life. For whosoever believes, and that's the hope, and that's what we bring them to. And then you let them know, hey, go think about that, you know. And if they want to pray, if they're broken right there, by all means pray with them. But follow up with them. Get them involved in the church. Start discipling them. Make sure it's not just you're Seeing some terrible thing. It's an awful thing to see that happen. It says here, if we think so, we are in trouble. We have to understand that profession of faith alone will never justify us, okay? It's just like if if uh, I tell somebody, you know, I'm going to fix your car today, and then they're like, great, that's wonderful. And then I never show up. And it's not so great, right? What good was it? It wasn't any good, all right? Something, too, you always see with faith is you see obedience. There is no such thing as faith without obedience. Anywhere in the Bible we see faith talked about, you'll see obedience spoken of. You know, we should be a people of holiness. Holiness. That's something that today, so many people are like, are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. Maybe a better question would be like, hey, are you holy? Do you have the holiness of God? Do you pursue, or pursue God's holiness in your life on a daily basis? That might be a better question for someone to frame when you ask them if somebody's saved. They're like, no. No, I don't at all. And then they maybe they'll put on some lines and say, well, Jesus paid the price, so I don't have to follow the law at all. Well, where in the Bible does it say that? It says Jesus came to fulfill the law, that he was the end of the law. He's what made it complete. Yeah, we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have to stone people anymore for their sins or different things anymore. But the moral law of God that we find in the Old Testament is just as much so as all that within the New Testament. And we can see it expounded upon over and over again. It says here, Possession of faith, not the profession of it, is the necessary condition for justification. I like the way this guy put it. The possession of faith, not the profession of it, okay? It's not just that you say it, but you possess it. You have this faith. You have it within you. That's, that's what salvation is, the possession of faith. And we didn't even get it in of ourselves. It says faith is a gift from God. Just like repentance is a gift from God. It says in Ephesians 2, 7 through 10, that nobody can boast. We are completely saved by Him. But if we're saved by Him... These things are going to result of it, okay? And there is a response that's called on. Even though God is ultimately in control, totally sovereign, there's a response on mankind's part that needs to take place. If the response doesn't take place, God doesn't do anything, anybody unwillingly. He doesn't save anybody unwillingly, okay? I mean, yeah, he grabbed Paul when he was going to kill Christians on the road to Damascus and put him in prison and things and, and brought him down. Yeah, God chose him. But how did he respond? He responded by humbling himself before the Lord, by following after him, and he lived a life that was, he just went on a, a, a dead sprint marathon for the rest of his life after he found Jesus is where Paul chose to go. Could Paul have made bad choices? Sure, he could have made bad choices, but he didn't. Can we choose bad things after we're saved? Sure we can, but we shouldn't. We should be submitting ourselves under the obedience of Christ. And if we're all the time not submitting ourselves on the obedience of Christ, if there's no being made holy in our lives at all, I mean, nobody's perfect. None of us can be perfect this side of heaven. But if we're not growing, then we got to ask, am I even alive? Or am I a dead man like everybody else out there and I'm just fooling myself? Like these Pharisees. These Pharisees thought they were alive. They loved the Word of God. They searched the Word of God. But they prided it on their own selves and their own righteousness. We need to humble ourselves before, and our salvation is from Christ alone. And it's in faith alone in Him that we're saved. And I got this, don't go by feelings. This is important. It says, that is why Paul does not say that we will be saved if we confess with our mouth. He adds a condition. You must believe with your heart. Okay, so there's a condition in that, you know. Not just confessing with your mouth, but believing in your heart. I used to get cantankerous. I'm sorry I said that right. Cantankerous with my seminary students when I would ask for their opinion about a particular issue as they would answer, well, professor, I feel, anytime somebody starts saying, I feel, you know, like, oh no, oh no, <laughs> let's not go here. But I feel that such and such is the truth. I would reply, I did not ask you how you feel about it, I'm asking what you think. Correction, conviction of truth is not a sensual matter. It is primarily the assent of the mind. We live in such a sensuous culture that people intertwine feelings and thinking. Paul understood that it is impossible to possess a mental persuasion that never gets to the heart. 
Okay? If it's not coming from your heart, it's not coming from you, then it's not real. It's like the guy that says, yeah, I'll fix your car today, and then he never shows up to fix your car. What kind of a guy would be that? It'd be like a plumber. If you had to get your house fixed for a plumber, you know, I might call somebody and be like, hey, you know a good plumber? And they're like, yeah, it's a good guy. Because I know he's got some kind of witness about him that he's going to be a good guy. He's going to get my house fixed. He's going to do my plumbing or something. But if I call some plumber and they never answer the phone, they never return my call, or they say they're going to come, they don't come, I only have a bad report to say about that plumber. I'll never call him again. I would never recommend that plumber, okay? We want to be people that are following after God. Luther following James teaching that faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible says, that faith without works is dead. If you don't have any works, you don't have any faith. The works don't bring about the faith, but everybody who has faith will have some works, all right? Ask, can a dead faith justify anybody? Luther answered emphatically in the negative. Luther said the only kind of faith that justifies is a fetus vivo. So it's in Latin. A living faith, one that is manifested in a life of obedience to God. Okay, real faith is manifest in our lives in obedience to God. The first ingredient of faith is note, which means there is content to the faith we embrace. We have heard the cultural adage, it does not matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Okay, a long time, well, I was backslidden for a while when I was a younger guy in the army, and I always say, well, it's all about the heart, it's about how I feel in my heart, that's what really matters. It's not. If your heart really feels a certain way, you'll be acting a certain way. Okay, you're not going to feel, be able to get that over and say, well, you know, I kind of really sincerely feel that's the right way, but yet I'm doing all these other things. I really don't believe in this if I'm doing all these other things. I've got to have, if I believe in it, and that's where my heart is, that's the direction that I'm going to be moving. It's not going to be this other direction. It says here, but let me suggest that it matters eternally and profoundly that we believe. It sure does. Somebody who's duped into thinking they're a believer, or duped into thinking like the Pharisees and the Jews, that their good works are given to heaven, that is an incredible wake-up call the moment they die. Next minute, and they're in hell for an eternity, I bet they would give back every single thing they ever had, every single thing they ever had, to go back, to believe in Christ, to confess Christ, to follow after Him. But the Bible says there will be no more. It says there's only one death, and then the judgment. There's no second chances. There's no purgatory. There's no paying for your sins anywhere. That's it. And, and it's, it's a huge deal. This is a big deal. Salvation is the biggest deal of all the deals that we have in the Bible. Is our salvation. Because if we don't have salvation, we're not stepping into the kingdom of heaven. This is like a, a, a showstopper. There is, there, there's justice that will be done. Justice will be done to everybody. Either we're going to pay the price for our sins, or Christ paid the price for our sins. If you're a believer, then Jesus paid the price for your sin on the cross. He paid for every one of your sins in full. And he paid what you would have paid for an eternity for in a matter of just several hours on the cross for all of those who believe. He did not pay for those who don't believe. Saving faith requires content, information, and knowledge. So if they're saving faith, there's more depth to it just than some words to say, yeah, I'm saved, or yeah, I've got some faith. Well, tell me about your faith. Well, I, I don't know. I can't tell you anything. Well, probably you don't have it then. Or if you do, somebody needs to disciple you and teach you and help you to grow. Because that's what we're all supposed to be about doing. As we bring people to the kingdom of God, we should be discipling and teaching them. It says, For with the heart, Romans 10, 10 through 13, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will, be not, will be not be put to shame. Okay, so we don't have to worry. None of us who believe have to worry if we're going to go to hell or not. Okay? If you believe in your heart, it means you're following after it because it's something you really believe, not something you just kind of think, yeah, maybe so, but I'm not going to do like the guy doesn't show up to fix your car. But the person that really believes, he doesn't have to worry. You're safe. You will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Who does he bestow the riches on? Those who call on him. And you know what, this probably really infuriated the Jews that he's talking to because he says the Jew and Greek. They hated the Greeks. They hated the Gentiles. They thought, we're the holy nation and the rest of them, oh, a bunch of terrible people. We can think about our own time. You know, maybe we think about Syrian refugees. Maybe we don't want Syrian refugees here. Maybe you think of some other things you like, don't like. Well, you know what? God has no partiality. It says in Galatians 3, 28, 29, it says there's no Gentile, there's no Jew, there's no man, there's no woman. It's all the same to him. He doesn't have any partiality. And this killed the Jews. The Jews were very racist people in a sense that nobody else was good except for them. They hated it when other people came around. Think about the story of Jonas. Jonas and the whale, we talk about Jonas and the whale, we know the whale with big fish, right? Yeah. Jonas 
did not want to go to Nineveh. Nineveh had, was a city of 600,000 people. It said it would take three days to travel from one side of Nineveh to the other side on foot. Because, you know, most times people were on foot back then, right? And 600,000 was giant. And these people in Nineveh would sometimes come to Israel and they'd raid them, they'd rob them, rape them, steal from them, do terrible things and everything from them. And God told Jonas, get up and go over there and preach the gospel to them. Get up there and prophesy to them, right? So that they need to repent and be saved. Otherwise, they're, you know, they're going to burn. And Jonas didn't want to do it. And why did he not want to do it? It says in Jonas chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he didn't want to do it because he knew that they would repent. He knew that God would change their hearts. And he hated these people. He didn't want to do it. And what had happened is he tried to go one way, and God's sovereign power grabbed the hold of him, Swallowed them up in a fish and bottomed them back out. But you're going to go this way, and this is what you're going to do. Because I'm sovereign Lord, and you're a man that needs to submit and obey me. And that's grace. That's grace that God did that to Jonas. Didn't just smack him down dead on the spot. That's grace that God took the time to correct Jonas, to help Jonas, to put him this way. And then these people did repent and follow after him. Now, people who had never heard, didn't have a life like Israel had following the scriptures. And they repented at this man's preaching through the power of God that was preaching through him right there. So the Jews had big issues with other people. And look at this. You know, it says the same God, Jew and Greek. This was a big deal still with these guys. But did Paul, was he like one of these big uh, social churches that I'm not going to say anything that's going to offend anybody. I'm not going to dare say that because I know they all hate those pagans. I know they all hate those, those Gentiles. No, he said it. And he said it's the same God for them, for you, for all of us. And it's the same opportunity for all of mankind to come to Christ. It says in the Bible, even in Revelations, it talks about, it's another thing for the Jehovah Witness, because you know, I'm always on that kick with these guys. They talk about the 144,000, and they say they're the only ones in heaven. In that same chapter, it's either Revelation 7 or Revelation 14, both of them talk about the 144,000. It says there was a great multitude in heaven, from every tribe, nation, and tongue, means from all peoples, praising God. From peoples, not the angels, from the peoples, from all the tribes on the earth, calling out and praising Him. This isn't some kind of like uh, American religion or Jewish religion. God is the God of all, the entire world. Everybody has to fall underneath Jesus Christ. It says here, For the same Lord, the Lord of us all, pursuing His riches on us all, who call Him, for everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. Now here's the same as, uh, as 2.32, Joel 2.32. Remember I told you I'm going to get to this point right here? So I put my slide a little bit farther back. But all those who call the name of the Lord will be saved. And who's it talking about right here? It's talking about Jesus right here. And if you go farther up the chapter, this whole chapter is about Jesus, confessing Christ, raising the dead, believing in Him. All right? The, the stumbling stone that, 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 that they had problems with right there. And it's a stumbling stone to them because they hit upon Jesus as they were going, and they made Him fall over. And they didn't get back up and get on the stone, okay? We don't see a lot of Pharisees. We think, like, maybe Nicodemus was saved, who we talked to in John chapter 3. and says, unless you're born again, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then later, we see that same Nicodemus buying him a special little funeral tomb plot, taking care of the body afterwards, probably a good sign that he became a believer after that. But not all of them were like that. We didn't see a whole bunch of the Pharisees changing because they stumbled over the stone and they never got back up on it. Only for those people who are standing on the rock of Christ are safe in salvation. Just because they bump into Jesus, it may be an emotional thing to say a sinner's prayer, and then they, they fall right over and continue on their way, doesn't mean they've got their salvation right there. Their salvation means they're standing on that rock, they're living on that rock. That's the salvation, and that rock is Christ. All right, uh, is another little quote. Paul makes this statement within a broader context. Even within the immediate context, he's not saying that anybody who calls for Jesus in a moment of trial will be saved. This is scary. This is real scary. I, I looked at this and I thought, wow, I never thought about that. The Lord warns us that when he appears and God's wrath is manifest against the unrepentant, they will be screaming for the mountains to fall and the hills to cover them. So this is that in Revelation. Screaming, you know, terrified because the world's falling down upon them in the tribulation. People will say in that moment, Jesus, help me, save me. It would be too late. Paul's statement applies to those who call upon the name of the Lord in the terms he has just used. A true call issues from the heart. It is an authentic reaching for the Savior. Anyone who calls truly will not be denied. So it's not like, you know, golly, I need Jesus right now, but you didn't need him an hour ago, and you won't need him after the problem's gone. That's not real salvation right there, okay? Real salvation is a perseverance of the saints. They're going to continue on. You're going to continue to stand on that rock. You're not going to stumble over the stone and try to get back on it when the waters get high and then jump right back off when it's more comfortable for you again, all right? And that, that's a scary thing. You know, read Revelations. Read about these things and the people, some of the people wishing they could die and they can't die. 
And, the, and at one point, some people want to repent, and they can't repent. That's a very sad thing. That's why we say it says in the Bible, today is the day of salvation. We shall not wait till tomorrow. We don't know if we have it tomorrow. It's only if God gives us a tomorrow, okay? He's the sustainer of all life. And if he's drawn us, the Holy Spirit's drawing you right now to come to him, to repent, to fall after him, it's something you need to respond to. It's something you need to follow through with. Otherwise, it may not come again. God may not be gracious and mercy enough to you to convict you, to love you, to draw you to him, because you're his enemy. When you're not with God, you're his enemy, it says. And it says that he died for us while we were his enemies. So picture this. Picture Jonas, when he went to these people that were his enemies, and yet God loves everybody, and he puts it out to everybody. But if you keep denying God and turning away from him, who do you think you are? No one's going to be able to stand on judgment day against God. Nobody. The only thing we could ever say, if anybody ever asked you how you get into heaven, I hope this is what you're going to tell them, is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. Because he paid the price I could never pay. There is nothing of my own self that would get me to heaven. There is no good works I've ever done that will ever get me to heaven. It's only because of what Jesus did on the cross, and he saved me, and that's the only hope that I have. I hope that's what every one of you say. You won't fall down to this good works line or something, because I go to church. Going to church doesn't mean you're going to heaven either. What means you're going to heaven is Jesus Christ and knowing him. Now, if you know Jesus Christ, you shouldn't want to go to church because you should want to grow. You should be around the body of Christ. You should want to be built up right there. Okay? It should be a natural effect. But here, the foolishness of preaching. Okay? This is how God chose to save people. By the foolishness of preaching. You know, God Almighty can do anything He wants. He's the foolishness of preaching. And a lot of times, if you guys in the Old Testament, these guys were like kind of like homeless guys and stuff, some of these Old Testament prophets and stuff. You know, He didn't take the fancy guys in the world. He took the lowly in the world to, to confound the wise, it says in the Bible. It says... How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And there's a cool picture of a pulpit like mine. But you don't have to have a pulpit like this. Everywhere you are in life is your pulpit. You know, wherever you work, wherever your friends are, wherever your family is, that's where God has put you, and that is your pulpit to share his truth. Because how are they going to believe unless you say something about it? It says it right in the Bible. Even though we know God's all sovereign, and some people they go to uh, hyper Calvinism and they say, they say, well, God's going to save who's going to save, and it doesn't matter what I do, so I won't do anything at all. No, God's calling us to go. He's sending us to tell. He wants us to go forth. It's a big deal. It's how He saves people. He ordained, God ordained salvation, and He also ordained the means by which it would happen. And the means by which it would happen is us speaking the gospel, us speaking truth to people. If we're not standing up speaking, people are not going to be getting saved. Somebody else is going to be. Every single one of us can think about somebody in our life that came along at one time and told us about Jesus. Somebody came and did it, just like right here. It wasn't just, like you just sitting there one day and saying, you know what, I think I should follow Jesus, all right? You know, it happens because somebody shares the gospel. Someone says the truth. Even the people you hear about, like the Muslims in the Middle East, they have uh, things where they see Jesus or something coming to them. Jesus came and shared the truth with them. Somebody came and shared the truth with them. All right? We need to make sure that we are going out there and sharing the truth with things. We need to be preaching. 1 Corinthians one twenty one says, it says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God. Through wisdom, it pleased God, through the folly of what we preach, to save those who believe. So this made God happy, the folly. That means the foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of preaching is how God, it pleases God to see men saved. This is how it makes, I mean, think about it. If you think, well, I'm just going to start saying all these things and saying how God made the world in six days and God had a, a Noah and he flooded and killed the entire humanity because of their sin, except for eight people. And then uh, God came into the flesh and then he rose from the dead. And while he was on the flesh, Moses and Elijah appeared in the Mount of Transfiguration and the glory of God shone and, and all these things happened. They'd be like, where are you coming from, man? What are you talking about? They won't even believe. But you know what? If they're, if they're called to believe, they're going to believe. Because this is how God's ordained it to be. He's ordained to be that through His Word they'll get saved. It makes me so angry. I talk to people that don't believe their world was made in six days or this and that. I think all you're trying to do is water down the Word of God so it'll be palatable to somebody else. And we don't need to water it down at all. In fact, the best way to reach people for Jesus is by speaking what the Bible says. Because it's not coming from us then, it's coming from God. And where that goes forth, seeds grow, things happen. It doesn't come back void, it says. All right. Uh, Romans 10, 15, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? So God sends us to go preach, okay? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, all right? We want to have beautiful feet. I want every one of you to have beautiful feet. I want to have beautiful feet. Yeah. Everywhere we go, I want to look at the opportunity I can share Christ. 
You know, I get buddies sometimes, they call me up, my buddy Phil called me just, just yesterday, and I, I was busy doing something, but I listened to the message this morning, and he told me how he went to get a CCW permit, and he started sharing the why we are, why we exist, who God is with this clerk at the sheriff's station, and how awesome it was. And I, I thought it was awesome too, I was like, yeah, this is so great, this stuff makes me happy. It made him happy, it just fills us up with joy, like, yeah, I got to share the gospel, I got to... I got to teach a little bit. I got to let some light shine a little bit. That's a good thing, and it's a beautiful thing right here. And that's the beautiful feet of those that go forth right there. And remember, we do it with gentleness and respect. Okay? We don't Bible thump and hit them in the head. That won't do any good. Okay? We don't force anybody. It's voluntary. There's nobody that's not saved voluntarily. Okay? Notice that as well, too. Okay? Even, I mean, God chooses us, yes, and then we voluntarily respond. There's always a response. Okay? You don't see anybody that's sitting there saying, well, God saved me, but I'm not going to church, and I'm not believing Him, I'm not walking the Bible. Well, obviously, they're not saved is what that is, okay? There's a response that comes involved when God chooses us and draws us. All right? Paul, his R.C. scroll says, Paul, quoting Isaiah again, says, I was found by those who did not seek me. Was Paul looking for Jesus on the road to Damascus when the bright light knocked him down from his horse? No, he was looking for Christians to throw into prison and kill. The last thing I was seeking was Jesus until he found me. Once he found me, I wanted to know everything I could about him. I wanted to go to church to learn more. All right, this was his quote. And this is how we should feel too. You know, we get saved. Jesus draws us. We should want to go to church. We should want to dig into the Bible and learn more and grow more and fellowship. I mean, this should be, this is like a desire that comes with being a believer. And if you don't have that desire, go back to the first rock to being a believer. Am I a believer? How, am I, how do I believe? By seeking Jesus. You know what it says in the Bible? It says he'll turn away no one who comes to him. Nobody. Nobody who ever comes to God will he ever turn away. So maybe, you know, the end times right there, but that's not, they already had their chance to come down to him and things. But it says here that he will not turn away anyway. It says all who seek him will find him. But the question's got to be, am I really seeking him? Or am I just seeking something to pacify me, to fit in my fictitious fake religion, to make my little world paradigm view work right? No, we've got to be seeking truth. That's what this thing's about, our truth project. We've got to know the truth. What is truth to you? It's what Jesus said to Pilate. If we don't know truth, then it's just a lie. Okay? What's the opposite of truth? The lie. So we're either in the lie or we're in the truth. And if we don't know the differentiation in between, the lines between, then we better start searching and seeking it out. Because when we seek truth, we seek Christ. We will find it. Okay? That, that's a, it's a guarantee. It's a promise from God, the Word. But here's Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So even all these preachers went forth, all these prophets went forth in the Old Testament, only a remnant ever got saved. Okay? The majority of the Israel nation did not go to heaven, okay? The majority. It's the remnant that gets saved. I had this conversation with somebody this week, and I said, I think only maybe 20% of people are actually going to heaven, if that. And he goes, 20%? Come on now, maybe 30% at least? He started off with 80%. I said, oh, no way. It says in the Bible, it's a highway to hell. It's a highway and broad, and many go thereby. And the path to heaven is very narrow, and few go thereby. And I saw this guy, and I got to share Jesus with him. That's when the sons got excited, and I to one of my other friends, man, I got to sit in the sauna with some dude for 20 minutes, man, I thought I was going to beat red, I thought I was going to pass out or something, but I was telling him all this stuff about Jesus, and he was asking questions, and as he was asking questions, I was giving answers, man, I think, I think it, and I was praying for him afterward, too, it was good stuff, but not everybody who hears believes, okay, is that your fault? No, it's up to God, you can't save anybody, so don't get discouraged, if you've talked to a lot of people and nobody gets saved, it's God that doesn't save in any ways, you're being obedient by going, being those beautiful feet. Here, all right, it says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, okay? So where does real faith come from? Like I said, people of faith doesn't mean anything. A lot of people of faith going to hell. People with faith in Christ are the only ones who are going to heaven. And where does the faith in Christ come from? The word of Christ. It comes from the Bible. If your faith is established in some man or some other thing, you're going to see it's going to disappoint you, it's going to fall down. Because it's all sand, it's going to slip away. But if your faith is on that rock of Christ, on his word... You're going to be solid. You're going to continue to grow. In Romans, this is the end of the chapter here. Romans 10, 18, 21. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Okay? So these, these prophets, they, they're either spoken. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. I'm talking about bringing the Gentiles and the pagans and everybody that, that was their enemy. 
Then Isaiah so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to disobedient and contrary people. And that's what God's done. Look at Moses. Look at the incredible things he did, getting them free from being slaves and going through the Red Sea and doing all this kind of stuff. And they still complained. They were awful of Moses. They treated him terrible. The man poured his life on him. The man was 80 years old when he started this trip. 120, he died in the wilderness with these guys. And yet they were always complaining, backbiting, hurting the guy. And, that's, and it, was, it was the prophet of God. Moses was a prophet. Sent to him. And what did the people do in return for that? Okay? Only two people made it to the promised land. Moses himself didn't make it there. His brother didn't make it there. His sister didn't make it there. Just Joshua and Caleb are the only ones who walked into the promised land out of maybe two million Jews that were out on that adventure right there. Okay? All right, uh, here's some John MacArthur. Paul knew how offensive that truth would be to most Jews. He began that chapter of Romans with great compassion and sorrow, testifying that he would gladly sacrifice his own salvation, and doing so would bring salvation to his unbelieving kinsmen according to the flesh. We talked about that last week. He's willing to give it up and go to hell himself if his own people could be saved. Romans 10 is equally offensive to Jews because the apostle here focuses on Israel's willing unbelief and the spiritual ignorance and divine condemnation that this unbelief Brings, all right? It does. And it hits them. And it hits. Could, see, we can relate to us, okay? We can relate to us like Jehovah Witnesses or anybody else that's in some kind of false religion, false way, and you try to show them the right way. And like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't care. I'm not even going to read it. I get people all the time and tell me, I'm not even going to read that. I'm not going to look at that. If I see something and we got a little thing going on, I'm like, well, can you look at this? Can you look at the scripture? No, I'm not even going to look at that. Then you're basically telling me that you think that you are God, that this is the way it is. You're not even going to look at it. You know, I can look at anything. I can look at any religious stuff, and I can see that it points what, what's wrong and what's right, and I can point into the Scripture and show them why. If I'm unwilling to look at somebody else's stuff, I need to think, do I live in a little box called lies? Do I live in a box that's sealed up and it's all full of lies, and my walls are built with lies, my ceiling's built with lies, and if some kind of truth comes into my box... It may break it, so I'm locking that hatch real tight. No, I live in a box called truth. It's not a box. It's totally wide open. All these boxes can come to me, and I'm trying to fumble through my keys to open up these boxes. I'm fumbling through the scripture to help them to see, to light up the truth, and to help myself to expand and grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. I can look at anything like that. But just make sure when you do look at anything like that, you also look to the Word, because things are very deceptive out there, very deceiving, very changing. I see things all the time. And they sound like such a pretty, eloquent thing. It says that in, in uh, Timothy, it says that people in the end times will want tickling of their ears for preaching. They'll want things that make them feel good. They'll want things that they want to hear. And they'll exchange the truth of God for a lie. Because they don't want to hear the truth of God. They just want good, feel-good stuff. But we went through this. It's not all about the feel-good stuff. It's about the knowledge. It's about what the Word says. And we've got to be careful. And, we're, and the best thing... I read about, one of the best things I read about this is it says, what does every church need is good biblical preaching. Yeah, children's programs are nice and all kinds of other groups are nice, but we, if you miss the good biblical preaching, if you decide to exchange your biblical preaching for something to make people feel good, you're no longer a church. You're not a social club. You're, you're, a, you're a, a soap opera show or something, a talk show to make people feel positive or nice, and you're really not what you should be doing there. If you're not preaching the word, what have you got? You've got nothing. I, one of these preachers, he said, he went to some church, and it was, the church was falling all apart. They had tons of problems. And they said, do you want me to, they said, can you preach there? And he said, yeah. Because he knew that the one thing that they needed was good biblical preaching. And when he started preaching there, that church came back to life again. People started to grow again, and it went on from there. It's about good biblical preaching. It's the same way we've got to be, too, with our own selves. As we read the Word, as we look at things, we need to test everything by the Word of God. You don't believe something because I say it. You believe it because you go to the Bible, and the Bible says it. All right? And that's how you believe it. You know, so that, that guy in the sauna talked to him for 20 minutes and almost passed out. He said, well, how do I know? How do I know what to believe? What religion? You know, because he started off Catholic, and I go to the United Church of Christ, which I think is a totally apostate church. But he said, he goes, how do I know what to, what to believe? You know, and I said, the Bible. I said, go to the Bible. Read the Bible and search it out. Seek Jesus, and you'll find the answer. You'll find it all right there. I'm not saying you have to come to my church. Or wherever, but I said, this is where the answer is. And this is how you find out what real truth is all about. And I, I pray, I hope that guy, that guy gets saved, man. I hope I see him again. You know, I don't know. But I can't spend that long in the sun all the time, man. I was for like an hour afterward. It was rough. All right? It was crazy. But we'll go ahead and we'll pray now. We'll close in prayer. And my plea to you 
is that if you are not saved today, that you would consider this chapter, look at how we get saved, that we call out to Christ, we believe in Him in our heart, and we confess Him, and we believe He was raised from the dead. That's salvation right there. And it doesn't take having to get our lives right. We're never going to get our lives right. If you think you're going to get your life right before you come to salvation, that's a big lie from the devil. Because you're going to come to Jesus broken. And you know what? Even when we're saved, we're still broken. There's not one of us here that can't say we don't sin, we don't mess up different things. We're just a little bit less broken than when we first got saved, hopefully. But we're broken people in need of a Lord and a Savior. A Lord who controls everything and a Savior who saves us from our sin. Because it's nothing but justice for us to go down the hill that we've all chosen to go down, that we willingly go down, that we fight against God every step of the way for. When God intervenes in our life and the Holy Spirit draws us to Him, we need to respond, we need to believe, and we need to keep going. And if you do come to Christ, tell me about it so I can disciple you, so I can teach you, so I can invest time into you, so I can help you to grow. Because it's, it's spiritual child abuse if you get saved and nobody else helps you to grow. That's where it's Christians, we're called to help them to grow, to teach and disciple. All those things in Matthew 28. And uh, if you are saved today, which I hope most folks are, then I, uh, I plead with you to, to, to take note of how beautiful the feet are that are sent and how, how important it is. You know, hold that thing. We sing that song about no more fear. By golly, that song is so true. There is no more fear of judgment, death, hell, anything. Because we know it's all solid in Christ. But we should have a healthy fear, though, of God. We should know that God is not on man level, okay? It's God's not some buddy pal that we pat on the back and then we're going to do what we're going to do and God's going to answer to us. God doesn't answer to anybody. God only answers to himself, and that's why he's God. So we need to go ahead and know that he's God and follow after him, worship him, and uh, stay that way and, and keep seeking him and following him and submitting ourselves to him. You know what? None of us are ever going to truly be 100% because then we'd already be perfect, right? But we ought to be trying to give it the best shot we've got to fall up to Christ. You know, this part of response with Romans 10, Romans 9 is all God. Romans 10, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's on our part right here. If there's nothing that we're doing on our part, there's some unhealthy stuff going on there. Okay, we should be seeking and searching after God. And it's not those works that save us. If we get prideful and think, I do all these things, my works are good. No, we're back where the Pharisees were right there. Okay, we've got to have our trust in Christ alone. So if you bow your heads, we'll go ahead and pray.